Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. And uh, congratulations, David, for an excellent opening speech. I think it's, uh, it's a reflection of the state of our debate. And it's great to hear somebody who's coming relatively fresh to this subject being able to encapsulate uh, the various elements. I'll try and give some value added. I, I've been working on this since I was doing my doctorate at Cambridge which means more than 40 years. And for many of those 40 years, uh, someone who was promoting basic income, like me, was regarded as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. And we weren't taken very seriously. It was the same with our economics. I was excommunicated, in a sense, by the advent of neoliberalism and uh, the transformation of the economics profession that took place uh, in the Thatcherite period. So many of us who had a different approach to economics were suddenly no longer treated as serious economists. But in the last five years, that has all changed dramatically. And I think we now have a perfect storm of factors that are making basic income part of the mainstream debate. For many years, I argued in various books and journal articles that the Thatcherite neoliberalism would inevitably lead to growing inequalities and growing insecurities and would foster a new class fragmentation across the world as globalization took off. And for a long time, the approach that I was trying to make was regarded as sort of marginal. And then I left the United Nations in 2005 and I wanted to write a narrative that could reach out to people who weren't economists. And I ended up writing a book, Work After Globalization, which looked at the need to reconceptualize what it is we mean by work because that is a fundamental part of this futurist debate. Throughout the 20th century, the politicians, the social scientists, the commentators, basically said, labor is work. And any work that is not labor doesn't exist as work. So the care that we, we give is not work. And the famous statement of Arthur Pigou in 1922 was that if he hired a housekeeper or a cook, national income went up. He could have added economic growth increased, employment increased, the unemployment rate declined, and the politicians would be very happy. If he marries her and she continues to do exactly the same work, National income goes down, growth goes down, employment goes down, and the unemployment rate goes up, and the politicians get unhappy. Now, you can't have anything more sexist and stupid than that. But that is precisely what our official statistics do to this day. Remarkable. It's an alienated way of looking at what we do and what people want to do. It's crazy. But that is the official way we do things. And there is no systematic attempt to reform that. Now think how crazy that is. So I wrote this book saying, look, what if we reconceptualized work and instead of looking at the relationships between employers and employees, we think about what it is we want to do as people in communities and in society. And actually, most things that are work that are not labor are the sort of things that most of us want to do. If you don't need the bullshit jobs dialogue, I've been saying this for, for years. I didn't, didn't invent the term bullshit jobs. That was my mistake. <laughs> but what I did do in that book is I presented a section. I said the growth of the precariat is the dominant theme. And whenever I presented the book around the world, 
I noticed the students stopped and listened at that section, the proverbial pin drop. So I decided to write a book that was just about the precariat. It came out in 2011, and it's changed my life completely. It's been translated into 23 languages. I've been invited to speak about the book and about the precariat all over the world. And every single day, every single day without exception, I receive emails from various people around the world different parts of the world, saying, I belong to the precariat. And the politicians and the social scientists are not taking any notice of me. And last two weeks ago, I was invited to speak at the London Labour Economics Conference. And I was on a side event, and there was a Labour MP, member of the Shadow Cabinet, woman, and she suddenly said, you've got seven minutes. I stood up and I said, well, seven minutes is a short time for the precariat. And she said, you're not the precariat, whatever that is. I looked at her and my blood pressure just rose a little. <laughs> and I said, guy, don't say anything. She said it all. But there were people in the audience who were part of the precariat. And they shared my anger. And basically what is happening everywhere is the precariat is saying, you're not listening to us. Last weekend I was telling David I was speaking, invited to speak in the Hay Festival. Now, for a, for a humble economist, that is a great tribute, a privilege. You know, you're, it's not the sort of thing you expect to happen, you know, it, and it was, they asked me to speak in six events. I had a debate, a public debate, with Diane Abbott. And she didn't get it either. She didn't get it. And I said, well, look, I'm working with John McDonnell. Uh, he, he's asked me to be an economic advisor. John does get it. John does get it. Working with Caroline Lucas, she does get it. They are looking to have a narrative that's got links to some of the things that David's just been talking about, but so far it's, it's not there. So for me, the precariat is an entry point for someone who's been promoting basic income. The linkages between the growth of the precariat, which is not covered by the existing welfare state. It is being most penalized, hurt, and destroyed by universal credit. Universal credit is the most cruel social policy of my lifetime, and probably the most cruel in the last hundred years. You're seeing huge numbers of people being put under incredibly stressful hardships punished by sanctions that have no right to be imposed. In one year, one million people were sanctioned. Not a single one of those people was subject to any due process. It was a bureaucrat from a privatized company that makes more money by more sanctions. So there's a moral hazard or an immoral hazard there. No trial no representation. I'm going to take away your benefit because you were late for an interview or you didn't come or you weren't there or you did this or you answered back. You spoke up with dignity. How dare you? Sanctioned. That's where social policy leads if you go with means testing, behavior testing, because all you can do is ratchet it up. The whole drift is towards a utilitarian perspective, which says the majority must be happier. We will demonize the minority because it doesn't, I don't give a damn about them, the disabled, the minorities, because they're not going to vote for me anyhow. It's a cynical, class-based, 
regime. That's not, it's a Saturday morning, so I don't want to get people too upset. But this whole ideological drift that has been orchestrated by the likes of Ian Duncan Smith, who of course was a military officer and is a stout Roman Catholic, and therefore he will give charity, but only if you behave as I want you to behave, as a responsible person. And we're going to teach you financial management. That's why we're stopping the giving of benefits for at least five weeks, or six weeks then. Now we've made it five weeks. You don't get it at least five weeks. Actually, it works out to be much more than that. Imagine if you are in the precariat, you've got rent, you've got debts, you've got a life on the line, and they say, not for five weeks, come back in five weeks. That's what they do. And why aren't we revolting about it? Because those people are being driven to being suicidal. I was reading about a case this week, a man actually who had written to me, 20 years old, 20 years old. He was in debts, they were blocking his benefits, and the debt collector was sent round, and he chained his bicycle to a lamppost so that he couldn't use his bicycle which he'd been using to make deliveries of pizzas. So he couldn't even get pocket money. He went into the woods and slit his throat. That's the society we're getting. That's the society we're putting up with. And people say we can't afford a basic income. Think about it. Now for me, the perfect storm that's taking place is partly about the growth of inequalities that are not being addressed. It's partly about the insecurities that are inevitable with globalization and everything else. The precariat being ignored. But it's also a part of the problems that we're facing is that we also have a political outcome of those things. More and more of the precariat who don't have a lot of education listen to the sirens of neo-fascist populism. They listen to the Donald Trumps, the Viktor Orbans, the Marine Le Pens, the Boris Johnsons, who play on the fears and demonize racist whistling women disabled, whatever their, their particular audience likes. And they play on something to corrode what David was talking about, a social compact. Thatcher made the infamous statement, you will all remember, there is no such thing as society. And the policies that she's unleashed and the outcomes are moving to the point where we are in danger of losing our sense of society. So she's achieving in the grave what she's been doing. And I've written a book called The Corruption of Capitalism, which is taking me to some very strange places, including Davos and various other places, to talk about it. And I wanted to call the book Rentier Capitalism. And it's about the fact that more and more of total income in our society, and all over the world, is going not just to capital, and a shrinking share going to labor, and a shrinking share going to the precariat, but going to rentier capital. The owners of property, physical property, financial property, and most of all, intellectual property. More and more of total income is going to the rentiers, and governments are bending over backwards to give subsidies to the rentiers so that they keep them in your country or they bring them to your country or they reward our, notion, our class interests so that they will give donations to our political party or person. Just consider the following fact. The biggest landowner in this country besides the Queen and the Crown Estate is the Duke of Buclo. 
He owns 277,000 acres, which to you and me is quite a bit. He owns that because, as his late lamented friend, the Duke of Westminster, put it when asked how to become an entrepreneur, and the Duke of Westminster said, well, the best way to do it is to have a friend of William the Conqueror as your ancestor, because he gave us the land. Many of those dukes, there are 25 of them, inherited their land through enclosure, through basic property theft. Genuine theft. Okay? The Duke of Buccleuch received in one year from our wonderful government 1,653,000 pounds in subsidy for doing nothing just because he has a lot of land. The more land you have, the more you get. So the big landowners get millions, and the small little chaps get zilch. It's a part of the perfect storm. The rentiers are gaining. If you own intellectual property rights, and you have a patent, which is probably being gained from publicly funded research, you have a Monopoly income for 20 years. Nobody else can produce that good or service. I've documented how extensive that process of intellectual property rights, which has been fostered by the US administration and US multinationals, but British have really liked it as well. Now they're all losing because China has learnt the same tricks and has become the biggest rentier state with its intellectual property rights. It's now filing more patents and industrial designs, etc., than the US, and Trump is lashing out, accusing them of theft, when that's precisely what the US did in the 19th and 20th century. It refused to recognize British property rights, paid bribes for any British person who went to the United States and gave them the industrial secrets, refused to acknowledge Charles Dickens' copyright, so he couldn't, all his books were sold by, by cheap publishers in the United States. He didn't get any copyright. And now they're saying, everybody else should obey our copyright. It's hypocrisy of the highest order. But it's a key part of this debate. Because you cannot understand the rationalization, the need to have a different income distribution system unless you understand the nature of rentier capitalism and the corruption that's behind it. The revolving doors, leading politicians, preparing subsidies and PFI and all of this stuff. And then mysteriously, by coincidence, shortly after leaving office, they're on the board. Now, Judge John Deed couldn't invent that sort of thing. I don't know if any of you have watched John Deed, but it's a sort of classic British establishment with all the dirty little corruption behind. But I give examples, numerous examples. Matthew Stevens was Tony Blair's health advisor in Downing Street. He prepared many of the privatizations of the NHS. Then he left Downing Street and went to work for the biggest private health insurance company in the world, in the United States. Shortly after he went there, completely, I'm sure, completely had nothing to do with him. Nothing. He was just vice uh, chair, deputy chair. Okay. Anyhow, United Health was found to have been defrauding people to over a billion dollars, and the chief executive had to step down and pay a minor f fine of nine hundred million dollars. Imagine. Now I don't. I. I mean, I'm sure it happened. I'm sure Matthew Stevens had absolutely nothing to do with it. So don't, don't interpret my remarks in any other way. But how does a man work in a company where the chief executive is found and forced out because of such a huge swindle and continue to work in the company? I say no more. Now he is back in charge of the National Health Service. And one of the first things he did was appoint 
to determine who gets contracts, a small group of firms to be advisors and also be able to tend for contracts. Guess which uh, firm is on that internal tendering committee? Guess what it is? Say no more. It's in the book. Now that's part of the perfect storm. Another perfect part of the perfect storm is the feeling that we're losing our freedoms. We're losing the capacity to be in control of our life. We're losing the capacity to be citizens. More and more people feel that that's their lot. Freedom matters. And, of course, helping very much to legitimize our discourse, the robots. The robots are coming, AI is coming, and the fear of the robots has led to a large number of very well-respected people, much more respected than any of us, to suddenly come out in favor of basic income. Branson, Zuckerberg. Musk, various other people, have suddenly decided that this is the, the future. I disagree with them in the sense that I think there are going to be plenty of things for us to do for the foreseeable future. Every new technological revolution ushers in what we call the lump of labor fallacy. That all our jobs are going to disappear, nothing to do, you're all going to be redundant and therefore we need a, a, a utopian response. Don't agree with that at all. We've had more technological advances in the last 25 years, and yet there are more jobs globally than any time in history. Okay? But what I do believe is that the technological revolution this time is more generically and systematically disruptive than any previous Industrial Revolution. It's affecting every part of the production and distribution system and increasing the inequalities and insecurities of people. It's disruptive. And it's part of globalization. We should not ignore the impact of globalization on this discussion. Globalization means with the technological revolution, with the neoliberal agenda, that you can reallocate production and employment around the world just like that. That's the key thing. And we've been facing a present, and we will continue to face it in the future, when the global labor force has increased by over 2 billion people in the last 15 years. And all of those 2 billion extras have been habituated to expect a living standard of 1 50th of what any of us in this room would expect as a norm. It's accentuated the growth of inequality because it's increased the power of capital and particularly increased the power of the rentiers. So the rentiers are able to extract through the globalization process more and more. And some of those rentiers have understood why it's happening and understood that it's unsustainable socially and politically in the future. I was invited to San Francisco and the Silicon Valley talk at Singularity University, and I was speaking to a small group of billionaire people who've made their money from tech, and I was talking about the rentier capitalism and corruption of capitalism, and one who's just been nominated by Forbes uh, the magazine as the entrepreneur of the decade, so no minor chap, okay? He's, he had a big art. There was a big article on him in the Economist recently, and he stood up and he said, "Guy, big chap he is. Guy, what you're saying is that the system is totally rigged." And I said, "Yeah, yeah." And he said, "I agree with you." and it can't go on. That's one of the richest men in the world speaking, okay? And we're not doing enough. 
So the imperfect storm is there. Now I want to conclude my talk by talking a bit about the book and the themes in the book. I just finished The Corruption of Capitalism and I got an email from Penguin, Pelican, saying would I try and bring all the work over 30 years together in an approachable book. And they offered me an advance, which doesn't happen very often for academics. And I said, Guy, I wasn't planning to do it, but this is an opportunity because it's about time it was done. In a way, I hope that people who are interested but are not necessarily wanting to be specialists and work on it in depth might be interested in reading it. So I wrote this, and in the course of writing it, not only did my anger increase, but also I felt a sense of optimism. And the fundamental reason for moving in the direction, notice what I use, the words I use, the direction of a basic income, is fundamentally ethical. Now, basic income would mean that everybody, every man and woman, every child, probably the lower amount, would receive a regular cash payment or the equivalent of cash as a right, as a non-withdrawable right, individually paid, not like many other benefits that are family-based or household-based. And it would be unconditional in behavioral terms. You don't have to do X, Y, and Z. And it starts from a principle that you can't expect people to be responsible unless they have rights in society. The, uh, the third way adage of no rights without responsibility starts by saying you prove to behave responsibly, then we might give you a right. No, that's not a right. A right is what you give people and then induce them to behave as they would wish. And the fundamental reasons for moving towards a basic income are threefold. First, it's a matter of social justice. The wealth and income of every single one of us, that Duke included, is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of our ancestors going back many, many, many generations than anything we do for ourselves. Ourselves make a difference, but Fundamentally, our wealth starts with the creation of the past. And fundamentally, it's derived from the commons, the natural resources, the social amenities, the social resources, the intellectual commons, the civil commons, the common law. These are all what determine our wealth as individuals. If that's the case, then you can imagine the social wealth as something collective and something on which we can receive a social dividend. If you accept private inheritance where you've done nothing, note, deserve that private inheritance, then why can't we think of a social inheritance? This goes back to the charter of the forest that I discuss in the book 800 years ago, it was a fundamental assertion of the right to subsistence of every commoner in the land. And that process means that we all have to share from the common resources. Our land, our water, the minerals, the air, the wind, these are all resources. And yet we are seeing the colonization of our natural resources. Our offshore wind industry is 93% owned by foreign capital. That wind is our commons. So for me, it starts from social justice. And the social justice can go back to saying, why aren't we having wealth taxes? Why don't we have a land value tax? Why don't we have levies on people who are making profits from our commons. And once you think along those lines, you say, hey, wait a minute, there's quite a lot of resources we can raise. A 1% or a 3% land value tax in this country could give us enough to pay out a modest basic income. 
Think about that. Okay, we don't have it. I happen to live in Switzerland where all of us pay a land value tax, a wealth tax, determined by how much land you occupy or whatever, and the value of your property. We need that in this country. We need a wealth tax, we need Tobin taxes, we need carbon taxes. But with all of those taxes, it only becomes equitable if everybody gets some of the proceeds equally. Because we're all citizens, potentially. So for me, that is an important justification. It's an ethical justification. It's got nothing to do with the efficacy of a welfare system or anything like that. It's an ethical justification. You can claw back from the wealthy through having a higher marginal tax rate or whatever, but it's to do with our commons. Establishing a commons fund, a sovereign wealth fund, like the Norwegians have done, like Alaska has done, like various other places are beginning to do. And from that fund, apply what's called the Hartwick Principle. The Hartwick Rule says that you should only distribute proceeds from the commons from, to the point where you're not diminishing it for the next generation. So you distribute from the proceeds as you build it up, just as they did in Alaska and doing it in Norway. That goes along, and I've got only a few minutes, it goes along with a religious argument. I'm not religious, but a lot of people still are in one way or the other. My friend Malcolm Torrey would argue from a religious point of view, he's written a very nice book from a Christian point of view, and essentially the argument I like best there is that if you believe in some religion, you will understand that God gave us unequal talents. We all have unequal talents. Some of us are lousy at making money. Should we be penalized because we don't have that particular talent? That's what happens. But if God gives unequal talents, a basic income would be like a compensation, a fairness dividend. And then, of course, there's the ecological argument, which to me should be given much greater emphasis in this whole debate. The ecological argument is that pollution of all kinds, global warming, the destruction of the species, the destruction of our commons, is fundamentally regressive. It's fundamentally inegalitarian. Because the polluters tend to be the wealthy and big corporations, etc. And we should say there should be compensation for the commoners for the loss of our resources and the destruction of the species, to the point where they stop doing it. One of the worst aspects of the Kyoto Treaty of 1997 is that the big multinational corporations managed at the last minute to change the rules so that instead of being fined for causing per corruption of very, uh, 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 pollution of various types, which is a form of stigmatization and, and pointing finger and it's going to have consequences, Right at the last moment, they got that change to purchase of permits. So they were able to buy permits to pollute. So it's a license system to pollute. We lose by that. They gain because they can get manageable costs, put it into their pricing policy, and consumers pay for that too. See how you have to think differently out of the box. Now, for me, the justice argument is one we need to be ramming down the throats of politicians and opponents all the time. The second argument is that a basic income would enhance freedom. And it would do three things. It would enhance libertarian freedom, the individual in state, the ability to say no to an oppressive relationship or exploitative employer or landlord or bureaucrat. The ability to say no. As David said, even a low level has an, uh, an increasing effect in that way. We gave in our basic income pilots in India, basic income to everybody, 6,000 people, over the course of two years. I've got a copy of the book, if anyone's interested, that we produced. And one of the things that came out during the evaluation and going back to those villages, was that nutrition was improving, 
health was improving, schooling was going up, women's status was improving, more work, not less, was being done. And I kept saying to myself, we're only paying a third of subsistence. Why are we seeing such big effects, both over time and by comparison with villages that weren't receiving the basic income? And then I came to the conclusion, which I think is a value added, I hope I've put in the book, which is that the emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value. It gives people a sense of resilience. It gives people a sense of solidarity. So when a person was hit by an accident or an illness or whatever, they were able to rely on their friends and relations and their community to help on a reciprocity basis. Not an individualized system, it was a system that emphasized social solidarity and this social compact that David mentioned. And we saw this because not only the resilience, but also particularly women and the disabled, that's why I've got a picture of a disabled woman who was a recipient, were able to get a little bit of dignity and a little bit of control over their lives. That sense of freedom went with the ability to say no to the elders. In one village we went, all the women were wearing veils at the beginning. Halfway through the experiment I went back and none of the women were wearing veils. And I said, why? And we eventually got some women to come forward and they said, well, before we had to do what the elders told us to do. Now we have some money, we can do what we want to do. That's emancipation. Now the third and final point, I've got five minutes so I'll try and get through it quickly. But the freedom argument is very important and I just want to quote from the book a wonderful passage which is from a 19th century liberal philosopher who wrote the following. Because you have a libertarian freedom, you have what I'm about to describe as liberal freedom and you also have republican freedom. Republican freedom is the ability to act in society in concert with others and at the same time not fear that you are under the control of unaccountable others. It's not freedom if a woman has to ask a husband if she can do X, Y and the Z. The freedom comes if you can do what you want because you won't do what you want. That's freedom. That's Republican freedom. Okay? But listen to this liberal idea. The real function of government being to maintain conditions of life in which morality shall be possible and morality consisting of the disinterested performance of self-imposed duties. Paternal government does its best to make it impossible by narrowing the room for the self-imposition of duties and for the play of disinterested motives. That's liberal freedom. I can respect that. Our government and successive governments does not respect that. They think they know best and you must be nudged to do X, Y and Z. And if you don't do it, you get punished. That surveillance panopticon type of ideology is a pandemic. Been through that. Now the third reason, and then I will stop, the third reason is that a basic income, again, even at a modest level, but seen as a, a journey we're on, a journey we're moving towards a higher level as we can afford it and build the resources, etc., gives people a sense of basic security. We live in times of chronic economic and social insecurity, where millions and millions of our fellow human beings are suffering from insecurities. A basic income is not a panacea, but a basic income would help give us a sense of basic security. You know you're going to be receiving it next week, week after, week after, the week after, the week after. You know it. It's your right. You can have an independent committee to determine the level, so it's depoliticized, etc. I've dealt with all those objections in the book, but essentially it is about security. Now the psychologists have told us and taught us many, many times that people who are insecure 
suffer a diminution of the mental bandwidth. Their IQ literally declines. There's evidence. Somehow, I don't think that's difficult to understand. If you're chronically insecure, you don't behave at your best. Take my word for it, and I'm sure some of you in the room understand that fully from experience. And not only do you lose the mental bandwidth, but you lose your sense of altruism. You lose your sense of tolerance of the other. You lose your ability to take strategic decisions. You lose the ability to be human, to be a citizen. A basic income would help give that basic security. And in giving the basic security, reverse all those trends that we're seeing. I think that argument, for me, is an ethical argument. I don't believe any of the alternatives that have been presented in the public debates are giving either justice, freedom, or security. A basic income must be part of our new income distribution system. I've dealt with the 17 objections, the 17 in the book, not 14, in, in the book, and the alternatives. And I'm, as a result of writing it, I feel even more convinced that we should move in this direction. And I've been enormously encouraged by being invited to give talks all over the country, all over many other countries. And I believe the precariat are going to be the progressive force in the next decade. And they understand why we should have a basic income. Thank you very much. Just, just one question for me, Guy. If we talk about a, is this movement moving forward or not? If I go back a couple of years, uh, there was lots of excitement. There was going to be basic income trials all over Holland and the Utrecht and so on. There was going to be a basic income trial in Finland. And there was even going to be a vote about basic income in Switzerland. But if I look, run forward to today, it looks like the various trials in Holland probably won't go forward, so they're not going forward anytime soon. Finland seems to be shutting down its trial, allegedly, and in Switzerland, of course, the vote was uh, rejected. So what's your view? Is, is, uh, is, what do you take away from these trials or the possibilities for these trials? Um, well, I've been involved in all of those that have been mentioned by David. Uh, going, starting with the Swiss referendum. We had no money when we started the campaign. We had no organization. We had to mobilize to get 125,000 signatures just to have a referendum, which was quite a feat, uh, which was achieved without any money. We had the banks. We had the political parties against us. We had the media against us. and. We were doing quite well, having rallies in various cities across Switzerland. And then one of our nominal leaders, self-declared leader of our group, was on television. And he was asked the big question, well, what level should basic income be? And he said, well, 2,500 Swiss francs a month which is roughly 2,000 pounds a month. Our support went down like a rock, straight away. And however many times we stood up in various meetings saying, no, we're not proposing. If you read the referendum, and I've quoted it in the book, if you read the referendum, it says the level would be determined by parliament according to affordability and other factors, not. But however many times we said it, still it became a referendum and it was written up in the British newspapers as well as ever. A ref should every Swiss receive 2,500? We were dead in the waters. And we weren't able to go around the various parts of the cantons around the country where 2,500 would be a, a wow, you know, transform everything. Because their average incomes would be 1,000, 1,500, okay? And I'm proud of the fact that where I was speaking, nothing to do with me, but we were able to have big rallies in cities. In Geneva, where I live, we got 38%, even that, despite that, even though we had no money. 
In Zurich, where we also had a big rally, we got 54% support. Okay? So we didn't do too badly. But everybody knows that in Switzerland, when they have referenda, first time round, they lose. And when afterwards there was an opinion poll, they said, found 68% of people said, this is the beginning of a move towards basic income. We will have it. The second one is on Finland. I have been advising the government. I didn't want the design that they went with, giving 2,000 unemployed basic income, and then they can take jobs or not up to them. Didn't like that design. But I then read three or four weeks ago, David just mentioned it, and the BBC and The Guardian said, ah Failed! Okay? That's a lie. Okay? Written by people who should have known better, didn't do their homework, and wanted that to fail. Okay? The idea at the beginning, and I was there, the Prime Minister and the people doing it, the Social Insurance Agency, it's a two-year experiment. It begins beginning of last year and will end at the end of this year. It began at the beginning of last year and will end at the end of this year. Did you hear me? It's still on course. The data are coming in. The right-wing Minister of Finance, who is against it for ideological reasons, has said that if he is re-elected in the next general election, he will kill it. If that's a view, that's fair enough. But I strongly resent newspapers, because they are particularly against it, writing articles saying it's failed when it's ongoing. Is that fair? That's called fake news, I seem to remember. The other pilots that we're doing in Canada are still ongoing. In Oakland, California, still ongoing. David's absolutely right that the destruction of uh, the, the Dutch initiatives has been one of the setbacks and it reflects the fact that it was captured by social democratic social scientists who've redesigned it as a, a nudge experiment in Utrecht and places like that. But I think some of the pilots that I refer to in the book have been very, very successful. So the book's available outside for a discount of a, is it two seven pounds? Yeah. So it's talk, so we need to we, we're doing a universal we're doing a basic microphone of this we've only got one microphone betwe between between all the speakers so there's now going to be a bit of a wearable dynamics here as the microphone is extracted uh, I know a lot many of you have still got questions I have seen on Twitter a number of uh, questions already uh, which we will come back to when we have the panel discussions later on the day but let's give uh, Professor Standing another uh, warm applause for kicking this off.